My name is Sharon Kaplan. I'm the museum educator at the JSMA. And we are pleased to have you join us this evening for one of our Leslie Dill exhibition programs. Uh, well, first I want to thank both English and Comparative Literature for supporting this program in particular, and also point out that there's a lot going on at the museum all the time. And so we'd love to see you come back for more of our programming. If you take our poster, the back side is the calendar, so please pick that up when you leave today. I will pass it off to Karen Ford, who's going to be our moderator this evening, and she will continue the introductions. Thank you. Welcome to our, our panel on Poetic Visions, a consideration of the work of Leslie Dill by three poetry colleagues whom I'll introduce shortly. First, I'd like to thank the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art per, for presenting the Dill exhibits and film, and Sharon Kaplan for inviting us to talk about our responses to Dill's work. I'm Karen Ford, an English professor who specializes in poetry. Someone told Sharon that I work on Emily Dickinson, so Sharon contacted me to see if I would talk on Dill's responses to Dickinson in her work. Since I get hives at any suggestion of adapting Dickinson's poetry to other artistic forms, I knew better than to be one of the speakers. But I recommended the three more open-minded and intellectually and artistically inquisitive <laughs> panel members we are fortunate to have here tonight. As it turns out, Dill does not attempt to adapt Dickinson's poems to another artistic medium. She says herself that Dickinson's words are her muse, not Dickinson the person, or not Dickinson the myth, and not even Dickinson's poems. Though Dill is a powerfully responsive reader of Dickinson's poems, and this is especially evident in the film, which I recommend, what she takes for her artwork are not poems, but the words and phrases that, she says, trail her as she reads through her Dickinson volume. Words and phrases that are, in the finished works, filaments of language, like the filaments of other materials so remarkably assembled in her work. Once I recognized that Shimmer, Sister Gertrude Morgan, and Divide Light were not poems, were not even translations or adaptations of poems, I calmed down and began appreciating what they are. <laughs> what they are, and in what sense they are poetic visions, are matters for our panel members to consider. Let me introduce them. After they've all spoken, we welcome questions and conversation with the audience. And they'll be speaking in the order that I'm introducing them, but I'm going to introduce them all at once. First, Deb Casey will present Words to Feed the Hungry Hunter, Prompts and Process for Leslie Dill. Deb is the Director of Student Support Services at the U of O and brings experience in fine arts and English to her grant writing and program design, providing services to students from low-income and first-generation backgrounds. With a BFA in painting and drawing and an MFA in writing, she works with both visual and verbal images. The recipient of an NEA grant for poetry, she has recently published a collection of poems, As Is, with Finishing Line Press. I suggested Deb for this panel because she is one of the most rigorous and yet gracious readers of poetries I've ever met, and because she is a writer and poet who works in the visual arts. Her first response to a work of art is invariably to wonder what the artist was trying to do. Her second impulse is invariably to enjoy the answer. Maggie Evans will speak second on bulb after bulb, secreting language in Dill and Dickinson. Maggie is a poet and a poetry scholar. In fact, she defended her dissertation on innovative writing by women last week. She has recently published an essay on figures of self-sameness, as she calls them, in the poetry of Emily Dickinson, and her own poems have appeared in, do in a dozen journals. I recommended Maggie for tonight's discussion because she thinks outside the box, or rather, I'm not even sure Maggie knows there is a box. She's an innovative poet herself, a lively and astute critic of poetry, and she is deeply thoughtful about women's experimental art. Our third speaker, Trace Pyle, is my colleague in the English department, where he teaches Anglo-American literature and culture from Romanticism to the present. His presentation is titled The Vital Word, Leslie Dill's Visionary Poesis. Trace has published many articles on poetics, the romantics, and an array of other subjects that extend from these interests, and he is the author of two scholarly books, the Ideology of Imagination and a Radical Aestheticism in the Romantic Tradition, which will be out any moment. I suggested Trace for tonight because he is singularly knowledgeable and passionate about poetry, poetics, art, music, and contemporary culture. One of his son's first words was art, 
<laughs> and I've watched Trace inspire and excite students about poetry and other art forms for many years. He is a poet and a playwright himself, and he sees all poetry in all its places, not just on the page. Thanks to the three of you for talking to us tonight. Thank you, Karen, for setting the tone so nicely. I almost want to pick up on some of your comments, but I won't. <laughs> uh, I appreciate being here, and I'm great, uh, grateful for just such a wonderfully extensive show of Emily Dill's, or of uh, Emily, <laughs> of Leslie Dill's um, work. As Karen said, I'm up here as a kind of visual verbal maker, marker, not at all as a scholar of poetry or of Dill, but rather just a really enthusiastic viewer of the work that she does. And I want to speak to uh, mainly the body-making part of her creative work, the conceiving, receiving, translating, transforming, taking in her sources of inspiration and making of them something new. So I'm thinking of that as Dill as Hunter. In fact, she used that phrase herself, with words as food, as fuel, as fire, and all the fluid kind of gush and gasp streaming uh, that energizes her. She's the artist committed to making the tangible intangible, to physically represent uh, prophetic experiences. And she brings a grand scale to her work, yet she calls herself a fingertip artist, which I love. Uh, important as she identifies our society as really being tactically deprived and craving touch. And it seems like that's what she really wants to give us, is that hard, soft, itchy, intense uh, sensation, and to get us to bring our bodies to her body of work, the human body and language, and to open the doors and drawers of the kind of less rational parts of ourselves, which is what she has installed all over upstairs. When I was thinking about her work, I jotted down incredible, and then I realized edibles right in the middle of incredible. And I think that's uh, a key to Dill, so much as uh, in her mouth. Um, I mean, I feel like the words just churn over. The tongue, the vision, and that's um, through a kind of reconstruction of words that she uh, creates her pieces. And it, I kept thinking of it sort of in a recipe sense where you incorporate things, where you're beating only until things are just barely mixed, but the ingredients are still discernible. And I think that uh, that's what she's doing when she's partnering her own experience with prompts that she gets from the outside and then brings all of her senses to those. So she's creating, and then she creates in so many veins as a multimedia sculptor, as a printer, as an opera director. In fact, she was saying she gets confused herself as to what kind of an artist she is. But in identifying language as what ties it all together, she feels like uh, she finds a touchstone for herself. And I think it's a touchstone for all of us. A longtime fan of visual verbal uh, poets, Kenneth Patchen and William Blake, who I know mainly from little books, I admit to kind of wishing that she too would just come out with a little book that we could hold in our hands and be able to browse through. But I'm also really grateful that she doesn't. I mean, she starts with these little sketches, but there's something in her that just makes her push them so far. And I don't know if it's that she just feels like she has to employ every sense, or her hunger is so great that she just can't satisfy what she wants to do. But I'm grateful that uh, she gets to where she gets, and I hope sometime she takes us back to where she begins, too. I want to acknowledge a few places that she speaks to beginning. Uh, and uh, I don't want to spend too much time here. I think many of you are familiar with how important. Well, there are three things she mentions. A prophetic experience that she had when she was about 14 that she identifies as black oak leaves against the sky. And then she says she became all I and was given to see the horrors of a war and viewing atrocities and yet feeling in kind of an entranced, blissed state. And then she forgot about it. Mm -hmm. 
And I think something like that happened to Dickinson at about the same age as well. And I don't think that, I, that there is something exactly shared there, but rather just some affinity that is recognized. And certainly that um, becoming all I remains important in Dill's work. Second thing, which is very obvious, is the Emily Dickinson collected that her mother gave her. And I love when she talked about it speaking to becoming intoxicated. And that intoxication also permeates her work. And the third thing was living in uh, India for a couple of years amidst the culture and language and uh, religion, attitudes there. And also discovering the metal ribbons that come down from some of the temples that are the tongues of God that she sees as, uh, well, that she learned you actually are speaking up to God on. And you can see those kind of remnants of those tongues up there. Um, and that's become very instrumental in her work. At first I saw all the little threads and danglies as being kind of loose ends or as ways of softening the boundaries. And then I loved it when she talked about how really they're filaments that are moving between the heavens and the earth. But I also think between the interior and the exterior, a lot of what she's trying to do is get to what it is outside that's sparked her internal uh, desire to respond. And these little filaments seem to provide lengths. Uh, whether they're horsehair, thread, metal, uh, big bands. As an artist of language in the body who emphasizes what spills from the body and dresses it, conceals and reveals, Dill speaks of us humans as being full of words, animals of language, words sleeping in us. For us, I think it's her physical sense attunement, her craving touch. I mean, her hands are always moving when she's talking. And she was talking about a book, and she was actually turning the pages as she talked about the book. And she spoke to being able to walk into a house and smell where the books are. Mm -hmm. um, she was also, when she was here for the opening, holding a bouquet of red and white roses and a little bag over her shoulder that she was kept slipping around and I asked her, it looked very awkward, and I asked if we could put it someplace that would be more secure, and she was very offended. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she said, no, this gives me something to do. I know no one here. And there was just such a physical relationship she had with those roses, which I think is part of what she, is her, that she brings to her art in every way. I think um, she's, I mean, it wasn't like it became a rosary bead, but it was almost like there was a meditation even in the way she held those roses. She's, um, she said, too, that we're hunters looking for that something. Our thoughts don't have enough, our thoughts don't have words enough. And that was part of why she wanted clothes to speak for her, those suits of armor to both be something to protect and also project. Whatever she's doing, she seems to be going two directions at once. And, uh, it was nice to just see that in her, re reassuring. In the same way that Karen was reassured to know what she was doing with Emily's words. I think she's, she's so respectful of what she's uh, working from. Uh, so I think she expands her vocabulary materially. She seems to have kept her mammal and animal senses really well tuned and doesn't kind of default to the brain to process things. And she also isn't given to close verbatim translations or linear restrictions. Uh, she just trusts her impulses. Uh, I know, um, I don't know if Maggie will talk about kind of pioneer hunter and mystic, but I think that there's something of that that's going on in that where she's kind of exploring two sides of the same coin and then just with great confidence pushing those relationships. When she talked about the, well, those those bands and uh, tongues from India inspired her to do this project, Tongues of Fire. When she was working on that, she went to a Baptist church singing session and talked about when she attended that, it was like her pores opened. It was just her body changed. And uh, I listened to Maggie read her a poem when she was here, and it was, I could watch her pores open. I mean, there was a physical response as she listened to the poems. When you hit the word gush, it was just like she was altered. Uh, and I don't want to over-dramatize it, but it was so exciting to watch such a physical listener. Uh, and and she's, I mean, it's a physicality in all of her senses. 
So back to her talk. She also, besides those three influences, uh, included a couple pictures that I think are important prompts in her work. Uh, one was a photo of her interns, unpaid interns, who uh, allow her to work in the scale that she works. And, the, and who I thought she very generously credited. And then she acknowledged her parents, and she acted like it was an accidental photo. But she also spoke to how important they are in her life were and are to her relationship with language, noting that her father, while being a very loving father and uh, esteemed teacher, also was diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic and had a real difficult relationship with words, which impacted her relationship with words. So that there was always one meaning and another meaning and another meaning in being inside and under and on top of every word. And then to kind of complement that, her mother taught speech and drama and was teaching her to broadcast and to put the words out there. And somehow, it didn't become polar for her. Again, she somehow made those impulses cohere. Uh, and as she seeks to make tangible the intangible and find those secret meanings, I think she looks for her ignition sources, like Emily Dickinson and like Sister Gertrude Morgan, who's, uh, we've got a couple images up there. And I'm not even gonna try to address the dresses and what all is happening and with the freeze and, the, and all the uh, little creatures that are cavorting through it, or those bands, but I do want to um, just speak about the, the kind of heated tension that I think she feels between the sublime and the horrific and how somehow she finds a way to occupy those oppositions and kind of herself becomes a vessel uh, of those contrary states. So that it's, I mean, it's not corny to say she kind of is the medium and the canvas, the landscape and its occupant. And she's tapping her own reserves as she makes contact with the exterior. And in that is when she's making, she's making flesh, dresses, banners, her art. So she tunes her senses to resonate with that energy and then follows the kind of pain and power of that with an amazing number of tools, her eye, her ear, her hand, all the time staying very particular in that fingertip sense of uh, attunement. And we see this in the uh, five pair of images that surround the dresses upstairs. And I want to focus on two of them. The whore of Babylon and intoxicated whore. I don't know if I can turn around and talk to these. I won't. I'll try to just talk to the page. And so I've got this microphone in front of me. So part of what I love about the whore of Babylon is that the whore is lost, I mean, from the very beginning. I mean, I see how and were and where and horror and WB, and I think of William Blake, and I think of Kenneth Patchen, and uh, it's hard to find the word whore. And in fact, I think we find the word baby before we find whore. And once again, we're to those oppositions that she's so wonderful at create, uh, finding. Uh, I think she trusts herself to a degree that most people, most artists don't. And so what I like about this is it comes from revelations about which I know nothing. I look at the image in the middle of it and I think, why is this creature on a horse and I don't know? And I think about the Whore of Babylon and it takes me, it took me a while to actually find that it was spelling that. And instead, I'm finding, I'm moving through it as how, where, where, blah, 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 a kind of babbly, baby, horror, horror, disintegration that just completely transforms what she began with from Sister Gertrude, and yet I think is really true to both what Sister Gertrude and she feels about the state of what was happening in Babylon and, and here and now. And uh, I just think it's a beautiful piece, and black and white and gray. Uh, in this series of five uh, paired images, she has a couple red splashes, but most of them are black and white. And also I noticed that it, the first image I had up, the Whore of Babylon was in the background, and it was in a different position. And one of the things I liked 
I mean, which surprised me. I would think she would have a very strict way of presenting things. But she spoke to how she trusts the installers in the same way that I think she respects the pieces that she draws from. She also respects those who are working with the art. What else do I want to say about the horror? Um, well, I guess I also like the way she makes an image, this woman, I think, with blazing head and tail and kind of bleeding, streaked, falling um, threads, a vowel. I mean, somehow in the middle of things, mm -hmm. this becomes web or wib or wober. Uh, and I still, I mean, I don't know exactly how that image as a, uh, as a woman on a horse is functioning, but the whole thing is, uh, works as a, uh, a remaking of the Whore of Babylon. And I think there's so much peacefulness in that central image, too, of this passage of a person through the center of it. Uh, how of Abby Baby. Uh, we could spend a long time just on this image, but I'm going to move next door to the partner piece, The Intoxicated Whore. And I mean, it's, I think this comes back to her intoxication with Emily Dickinson and her intoxication with life and language. And um, while there's the horror part about this, in the same way that there's hell and heaven and bride of Jesus, I mean, I guess I didn't provide any context for this set, but uh, maybe that will save for another day. <laughs> uh, I want to look at just the words that are in intoxicated. One of the things I like about it is how many ways there are to read it, and that you can't skim it. By the wine of her adulteries, the woman was drunk with the blood of saints. That little O disappears there in there. Low down, dirty, cheating, eating, we see first. Tricking, lying, fornication, from Sister uh, Gertrude Morgan. Ragged lips, mouth, void desire, from Tom Slay. Do you know? No. It is your mouth so often make you sick, your tongue so often make you say and do so many funny little tricks, from Sister Gertrude Morgan, exuding every poor, warm, spermy odor, Kathleen Ann Porter, whore, intoxicated whore. I mean, I think you just have to keep spinning and turning on it. and. Her use of three different fonts of the different uh, capitals and upper and lower case and broken words uh, transforms everything each one of these people said into something new that she has to say about um, well, that speaks to a spiritual place that I think she shares with uh, Sister Gertrude Morgan. skipped around in all of that. Uh, some, uh, and I think in it, she also catches all the preachy style of uh, Sister Gertrude. So we get a whole kind of stuttery story of sin and offspring, birth and decay, with the baby word as strong as the whore. Uh, a delightful fracturing and reconstruction that nails something inside Revelations and Sister Gertrude and Le Leslie Dill. Um, I think we've probably covered enough on this image across uh, next to it. Across, right across from these images upstairs is another woman on a horse that's become skeletal and uh, that one's connected to hell. And again, there's so much happening in her work that one could spend a long time looking at those connections. And I can almost hear Dill regurgitating what Sister Gertrude Morgan fed her. I mean, it's almost like the little puppy who licks the mother's nose and then the, you know, the two are just gone from there. Uh, I think she's fed by all of these different writers, their phrases and experiences and the translation is like a, a kind of pounce, seize, absorb of a hunter who scores. 
and Dill obsessively devotes herself to expression that tries to capture just what's been kindled or lit with a real devotion to the process of making. She says she's giving to us the gift of time, and which is an interesting way to look at it. Though there are many strands I'd love to pursue on that, I think I'm gonna bring uh, bring it instead to just mentioning again how important I think it is that she acknowledges those interns who work with her, who contribute to the time that she can give to us, and also make her no isolated poet in the attic or in her own studio. She's not in some solo silo. She's really connected to a lot of people and, uh, and mediums and uh, she, I mean, she knows that she is going to get behind and underneath and inside those words that mean something. And then, then really let it be heard. And she wants everybody to hear it. Uh, the, other, uh, in, the other influence I want to mention before I'm done here is that the other photo she showed, which was of her husband, and who's very important in her creative process, who's an extreme journalist who covers the war zones in the Middle East. And he too nourishes her awareness. In his case, it's of atrocities, and willing to be open and vulnerable uh, to embody and then give shape to the tension between the cruel and horrific behavior we humans are capable of, as well as the kindness. She follows her kind of obsession-focused focused awareness of that and gives shape to that tension. I think she bridges those polarities and pools the contraries and increasingly is finding ways to decorate and display the kind of scary potential for violence and kindness that's within each of us and really looks to her husband for that, that fuel. When, do, uh, when Dill spoke of unfathomable cruelty existing in our world amidst good, kind people, she said something about the need to put myself where my life is, telling the big story which is in each of us living. Working with her crew of unpaid interns has contributed to her ability to do this, and I think to both make things big and communicate big. It's, uh, I mean, I think it's amazing that uh, we're used to seeing these little kind of five by eight images. She's working 12 times that size. And even though I want to see them small, I'm grateful for how big they are and to be able to see and track the development of these pieces is, I mean, she shared a lot with us of that process. I marvel over how she pushes the concepts, how she mediates between poles, meditates into her creations, giving back as she puts it time, a kind of her, her obsession, made material, and I think it's an invitation to us to be as devoted to um, repetition, to soothe and to mark time, to tune into our senses, all of them, and back to the mixing bowl, incorporate. <laughs> all right, thank you. So generally, the work that I do, I do alone in my room, and I don't get to talk to anyone. I read poems, I write poems, and, and it happens in a very isolated, sort of lonely way, a solo silo, I love that phrase, um, that Deb just used. And this is a rare opportunity to get to do conversation, and I'm really excited about that, and I'm grateful to the Schnitzer and to you guys and to everyone who came for the chance to have a conversation and to talk about this work. Um, the Schnitzer's promoting conversation between Dill and between all of us through this show, promoting conversation between Dill and Dickinson um, by inviting um, Karen and I and, and other um, folk, well, I say us because of Dickinson, but you know what I'm saying. Anyway, um, by inviting us to talk about Dickinson and Dill. And luckily, there's also a conversation that I got to have um, with Leslie Dill herself. She was generous enough to have an hour-long phone conversation with me in preparation for this panel. And I feel like there's so much that I learned from that that I want to just kind of play a tape of it for you. Um, obviously, that's not appropriate, but um, <laughs> it's, it's running in my head right now. So I'll probably be quoting that occasionally through our conversation. And as any of you who went to Dill's talks can attest, her conversations are marked by openness. She shared, as, as Deb mentioned, a lot of details about her family, about her father and her mother, about her husband. This kind of openness that she has is really remarkable. 
And there are a few things from that, that that I'll bring into the talk, some of which Deb touched on as well. But what I also want to notice is that even with all of this openness, there's a, there's a duality that comes out of these conversations that's also closed off in a way. There's a concealment that happens in the work and in the poems of Dickinson, as we'll see, that I want to sort of draw out at first by talking about Dill's life a little bit. So she mentions that her uh, father and her mother had very different relationships to language and that those influenced her. And I'll skip through that a little bit since, since Deb talked about it. But that is that her mother was a performer, uh, a speaker, a public speaker, and her relationship to language was communicative. The words went out to other people. Whereas her father um, often invested language with, with treble meanings. Everything was sort of packed in with language. And you could never be certain exactly what, well, I don't, I don't know about never, but you couldn't always be certain of what a word meant. And so that kind of duality between a word that establishes a connection or a word that sort of closes you off, you can't be sure what it's saying to you, is something that I want to keep in mind as we sort of look at some paintings and some poems, sorry, sculptures. But I need to get my uh, thing set up here. I forgot about that. So I can talk loud, I think. Um, oh, it's already up. It, magic happens. I didn't even see you do that. <laughs> Wonderful. So I didn't need to get up after all. So. When I talked with Dill on the phone, there were a lot of uh, wonderful images that came up in our conversation. And one thing that, that came about is she mentioned that her relationship to words was like her relationship to other people, that she saw dealing with words as getting to know them in the way that you get to know a new person that you've met. And that she was excited about that process of getting to know a word, and she compared it to a flower opening that it starts as something that's close to you, but the longer you spend with it, the more open it becomes. So that's one image that I want to keep in mind for that kind of communicative language, that reaching out. On the other side, she moved to talking about language as walking into a room, and you mentioned smelling the books, walking into a room full of closed books and sensing that they were full of language. But this is not an image of opening a book. This is not an image of communication. It's an image of being surrounded by things that are closed to you. The books are closed off and they contain words inside of them, but you don't know what they say. And that clearly gave her a sense of uh, enticement. But she didn't want it all laid out in front of her. She liked that feeling of things being sort of closed off. So I want to keep that flower opening and the book closing sort of in mind as we move forward. And because I love puns, I've tried to capture those two um, elements in my title here, and that is the word secreting or the word secreting. So, huh? yeah, puns. <laughs> so the, the, we see secreting in Dill's work, and I think some, some pretty obvious ways. If you, if you go to the show here, I'm thinking of Shimmer, but also of other works that are not here, where language is sort of coming out of people's bodies. It's coming out of their backs or being trailed behind them as they move, secreting out of their bodies in this really physical way. On the other hand, there's the other meaning, secreting, and that's an active verb to secret something, to sort of hide it away. So I'm hoping that those two meanings will sort of stay in our minds as well. OK. So I've reproduced shimmer here to first sort of point to this kind of secreting that we're talking about. And as Deb pointed out as well, fibers and filaments are really important. And when I asked Leslie Dill what materials she most connected with her urge to communicate, with her urge to sort of secrete, she said, fibers, filaments, threads. So these are the places where, where language is sort of reaching out of itself. And you can see that here very literally, where the words cascade these fibers out. They aren't <laughs> contained in themselves anymore. And there's a sense that these words were holding all of this power in, and then Dill opened them and hear this outpouring, this waterfall, this natural power that was sort of holed up inside the words has been let out. It's got a, an electricity to it, which you can see when you look at the wires, they sort of sparkle and spark. They have a, a liquid electricity, which is obviously a very volatile sort of combination there too. So that seems to me to put this piece pretty firmly in the camp of the, the flower opening, of the uh, secreting, of the coming out. 
But at the same time, and as you can see too, the words here are very readable in a way that they're not in a lot of Dill's work. She's repeated the words along the top and the bottom of the piece. You can read everything that it says, which is not true for um, a, lot of the, a lot of the pieces here. But the words are only readable because they're repeated. And here, you can see that there's very small wire words from which these, these outpourings of wire are coming. And they are not legible. If you go back, you can't read, even, even when you're there up close, which I encourage you to go and be if you haven't, um, when you're there up close, you can't see um, exactly what the words say. They're hard to make out, which this makes a little bit clearer, clarifying the fact that they're not especially clear. Um, so there's a duality here between legibility, something that establishes a connection, something you can read, but something that's also held off from you. And when I was talking with Dill about where, where she sees language sort of um, secreting and hiding things away, she said that she often chooses language that is difficult, that's hard to understand. So there's the physical difficulty of reading. It's hard to see what the words say, but there's also the difficulty of understanding. This, this line about God and handles, it's, it's hard to, to grab a hold of. You know, you, it, it stops you as well. So you can't quite read that either. Even though the words are printed very clearly at the top and the bottom, it's hard to read. And that kind of difficulty, I think, leads us into why Dickinson is so important for Dill. Dickinson's words are often hard to read in that way. Even if you present them very clearly on the page, you can't quite be sure what they're saying at times, especially if you read them carefully. The longer you read them, sometimes the, the harder it is to be certain what they're, what they're saying. So that kind of resistance, that kind of, of secreting of language is at play here, even when it's so obviously a secreting of language. And I want to look at how that plays out um, in Dickinson's work as well. Okay, what am I forgetting here? Ah, yes, I wanted to remember something that, that Deb said as well about uh, your thoughts don't have words every day. The words are sleeping inside you. That kind of aesthetic of sleeping words fits with Dickinson's model of there are, there are bandaged moments that are not braid of tongue, that there's a certain uh, desire to keep something back that I want to look at more closely in this poem uh, commonly called Split the Lark. This is the poem that I read to Dill at the opening because it seemed so, so much to me to speak to her work at the time and through the magic of technology, I was able to uh, find it quickly on my phone and share it with her and it, it was a great moment to sort of, uh, she hadn't actually read this poem. So I'm not arguing that, that this poem is an influence in a direct sense, but rather that it shows that Dill and Dickinson are moved by similar uh, desires. that here so I didn't have to turn around. Split the lark and you'll find the music, bulb after bulb in silver rolled, scantily dealt to the summer morning, saved for your ear when lutes be old. Loose the flood, you shall find it patent, gush after gush reserved for you. Scarlet experiment, skeptic Thomas, now do you doubt that your bird was true? So my sense at the beginning of this poem is that the image is of a lark that's been split. So clearly there's an, there's an experiment happening and a scarlet experiment emphasizes that. So there's a Thomas, someone who has doubts perhaps, but also perhaps a Thomas Edison figure, someone who is pushing to discover something, uh, which fits both of those figures, the doubter and the discoverer. This, this Thomas is encountering a lark that he has doubts about. Does this lark really have music for me? So that means the lark hasn't been sharing its music. It's been holding it back, keeping it inside. And we have that bulb after bulb in silver rolled, which really calls to mind to me uh, Dill's aesthetic, these kind of repeated forms that are, that are grouped together and rolled together. And it also calls to mind shimmer for me, these, these things that roll out in these silver, well, they're not bulbs, but they are gushes, which comes later. So you have Thomas and his lark, and in order to find out whether his lark is true, he splits her open to discover the music inside. And as you might imagine, this has disastrous effects for the lark. Gush after gush reserved for you, scarlet experiment, the images of the blood pouring out of the lark, 
Well, there it is. It was there all the time. But the only way to find out was to, to open the lark. So this would seem to put Dickinson on a kind of oppositional position to Shimmer, where Shimmer is invested in this gushing, this flowing out. Split the Lark is saying that that's disastrous, that's deadly for the thing that makes music. But it is not so simple as that. Because as you can see here, the bulb after bulb in silver rolled, the gush after gush reserved for you, Dickinson's poem is revealing the very thing that she criticizes the Thomas for revealing. She says, you shouldn't, you shouldn't open the lark to see what's inside, but that's exactly what this poem does. This poem splits the lark and shows us what's inside. It shows us the bulbs, it shows us the gush. So she has it both ways. She's telling, she's telling off Thomas for not trusting the lark, but at the same time, she is the scarlet experimenter. She's the one that's driven to open this bird up and see what's there. And I think that this poem really teaches me how to read this piece of Dill's. Now, this piece isn't here, um, but uh, Dill's website is actually really well done, um, and you can see a lot of her work in these really nice photographs there. Um, so the first... The first image on the left is of the, these are the same sculpture. Uh, it's called Hinged Poem Dress, I believe. And this is one of the few times where Dill reproduces an entire poem. So this poem, uh, I believe, begins, um, I heard as though I had no ear. And she, re she, she produces the entire poem on the dress. But you can't tell that in the first in the first in instance of the dress. You can see that the letters are upside down on the bodice, and then the, the sentences do not go across the front of the dress. So while it seems to be sort of doing this secreting of language, is communicative, more communicative than some of her other work by including the whole poem, at the same time it shuts you off from reading that whole poem and forces you to encounter the words as letters, as, as turned upside down, as separated out from the meaning of the poem. However, it's a hinged dress, and you can open it. And when you open it, this doesn't show that well enough because it does it backwards, but if you were standing on the other side of the dress, you could read the entire poem. It reads across as an entire poem. So here, if you should decide to be a Thomas, you can split this lark and you can see what music it holds inside. But you have to do this opening up. You have to, you have to dissect, you have to experiment. And to me, that really gets at these these dual modes in both of these artists, that there's a desire to keep it closed off, but at the same time, the need to open it up, the need to see what's there. And that duality, again, I think appears that when you open this dress, it is an image of dissection. If any of you have dissected a frog, you can sort of think of the way you pin the skin back and the way that these pieces of the dress look when you open it up. But it also takes on flight. It begins to look like wings transcendent. So the act of opening this, this lark, if you'll go with my metaphor a little further, um, creates both the violence of experiment and the transcendence of flight. Okay. <laughs> I skipped a page. So it seems clear to me, and I think that if you look at the work here, and if you look at Dill's work in general, it seems clear to me that violence is really important in Dill's work. And one thing that I think that teaches us, and something that Dill brought up in our conversation, was that Dickinson's got a lot of violence in her poems. And so that's not something we often think about, but you have her talking about putting out eyes and stapling feet and these kind of really violent images that get washed away in our, some of our popular images of Dickinson. So Dill can teach us to read Dickinson in an important way. On the other hand, it's easy to see Dill, you can walk into to Sister Morgan or any of these gorgeous pouring out sort of shimmering pieces. It's easy to see her as um, less interested in closing off. But reading Dickinson can teach us to see the places where Dill tells us to leave the lark closed, to, um, to not necessarily open it up and see what's there. And in fact, if you go in and stand in front of Shimmer, that's the secreting, everything sort of pouring out at you. But if you turn around, you see this image. Much less 
sort of open, make, making much, much less of an effort to sort of physically come out at you from the wall. It's flat. The only legible words here are match me the silver reticence. So the words you can read are about reticence, about holding back. And then the dress itself, which may not be clear here, all of this is letters. And the letters are actually from a poem by Tom Slay, which is, which is a fantastic poem, but you would never know that from looking at this dress. You can't read the poem. The language is so densely packed, there's so much of it that it becomes impossible, which to me recalls something of Dickinson as well. When words become so packed on top of each other, sometimes they form an opaque surface, a sort of protection that, that doesn't let you in, like clothing in this case. How am I on time? <laughs> you said you would tell me. I forgot, I got interested. <laughs> we're doing, are you close? Uh, yes, I'm yeah, close. Yeah, we're, we're okay. Okay. So this, this poem, Match Me the Silver Reticence, the line comes from this poem by Dickinson. This that would greet an hour ago is quaintest distance now. Had it a guest from paradise, nor glow would it, nor bow. Had it a notice from the noon, nor beam would it, nor warm. Match me the silver reticence. Match me the solid calm. Now, this is a strange poem. Um, it, at least for me, I don't sort of walk into this room and know what all the words say. Um, I find myself casting about a little bit. But what I can come to is that we're looking at something that used to be familiar, this that would greet an hour ago, something that you could walk up to and say hello. I'm sort of going with a person, but that could also be metaphorical, something that is familiar enough to you that it constitutes a greeting. Suddenly becomes quaintest distance. Now, to me, the word quaintest here exemplifies what we've been looking at in both Dill and Dickinson, and that is, it has several meanings, just like secreting and secreting, just like D uh, Dill's father's words where one meaning has another and another. Quaintest can mean, according to Dickinson's lexicon, strange and peculiar, pretty and pleasing, fine spun and exquisite, and also unreachable and incomprehensible. So the thing that used to be so familiar to you that, that you could greet it, now it's, it's so far from you, and yet at the same time, exquisite and beautiful. And, and it seems almost because it's so far from you, it becomes exquisite and beautiful. In fact, it's so exquisite and beautiful and so far away that it can resist any kind of illumination. A guest can come from paradise, doesn't matter. Still remains far away, unreachable, won't greet you. It could have a notice from the noon, a beam, a warm, something elementally lightening and warming. It's still a silver reticence, it's still untouchable. And there seems to be a clear admiration for that untouchability here. Indeed, match me the silver reticence, match me the silver calm gets at that admiration in a couple of different ways. It could be, show me the equal of this anywhere. Match me this, I can't find it anywhere. Or it could be her speaking to herself, match me the silver calm. I want to find a way to match this in my own life, in my own body, to have the same impenetrability, the same immunity to illumination. And to me, that is what unites Dill and Dickinson, is that they emphasize this choice. There are fantastic moments of gushing, of, of secreting, of effusion, of, of filaments that connect between, between artist and, and, and viewer, between poet and reader, between poet and thing, artist and thing. There's these filaments going everywhere. But there's still the power to choose. Even when you're facing noon, even when you're facing a guest from paradise, you have the choice to retain a silver reticence, to sort of step back and be opaque to pull away from that. And so I think that, that both Dickinson and Dill can teach us to read each other, well, each other, but also they can teach us to read each one the other in, in ways that are really uh, in, useful and informative and inspiring for me personally. So thank you. First, I wanted to uh, thank Karen Ford for that lovely uh, introduction. I want to package it and bottle it and carry it around with me all the time. And um, also, uh, she told a, a lovely story about 
my son's first word being art, but she forgot the slightly <laughs> revealing, less flattering dimension of it, which is that he used to walk around my house filled with ridiculous pieces of very um, uh, fragile things and point to them and say, art, no, <laughs> art, no. So it's a very different dimension of the aesthetic, one that I, I, I'm slightly embarrassed about. But. On the rare occasions I've been asked to say something about contemporary art, I've had the very good sense to say that I'm a romanticist with nothing more than a dilettante's enthusiasm for contemporary art. So I must have been knocked senseless by the Leslie Dill installation to have believed that I might have something or anything insightful or interesting to say about her work. But this occasion has given me the opportunity to learn much more about her art today from Maggie and from Deb. Of course, as my students and colleagues well know, I see everything, and I mean everything, through the lens of romanticism, including the beautiful pieces, pieces assembled in this exhibition. So I know it will be predictable when I say that I believe the work of Leslie Dill to be a late and glorious example of a romanticism that, however Americanized, finds one of its sources in William Blake's visionary poetics, and Deb alluded to that. Dill belongs to this Blakean lineage not only for her emphasis on art as the medium of a spiritual illumination, one that often takes the form of representations of ecstatic visions and visionary states, but also for the way in which her work, like Blake's, is animated by the shimmering relationship between poetic language and the visual image. For Blake, poetry was illuminating in a literal and figurative sense, and his visual images were most often saturated with text. And if nothing could be more predictable than my subtitle for these remarks, Leslie Dill's Visionary Poesis, which merely borrows and inverts the title of the installation, I hope that by thinking a bit closer about these two terms, we might see how there is nothing predictable in the way her work the vitality of its words and images animates this tradition. We tend to associate the term visionary to the poet or painter who's able to see or receive visions from above, often in an ecstatic state, or turning now to Dickinson, in an ecstatic instant, a moment for which worldly time has no purchase. Coleridge, always in one of those states, coined the term visionariness to describe the state or propensity of visionaries to be available to such visitations, like the visionariness of the magnificent sister Gertrude Morgan, whose own exuberant paintings and delirious texts, composed bold, of bold primary colors and white shoe polish, serve as the inspiration for Dill's exquisitely disassembled homage. But I'm doing a disservice to Sister Gertrude to call her images her own. She was always consistent in her belief that she personally had nothing at all to do with the images that like the vision of the new Jerusalem that animates her work, they came entirely from God. And who other than God but genuine visionaries would have the audacity to dare divide light itself or dare represent the all-seeing eye? But the word visionary is always carried with it a pejorative definition, also associated with romanticism, of something unreal, immaterial, something that exists only in the mind's eye of the self-proclaimed visionary. It is for this reason that I wanted to use the term poesis, not just as a fancy way of saying poetry or poetics, but to stress the Greek definition of the word as making, which for anyone with a passing knowledge of Blake knows was crucial to him as well. The techniques by which he made his pictures and poems possessed a deeply spiritual significance. This is the poesis that one encounters everywhere in Dill's work, one which is carefully documented in the film. These are collaborative projects, the opera based on Dickinson's poetry is the most obvious example of such collaboration between artists, composers, singers, players, designers, and poems. Everywhere in the work, she avoids what Deb calls that solo silo. Everywhere in the display in her work are the seams and traces of making, the cutting, the stitching, the weaving, all of which exposes the process of the art as a temporal form. If visions seem to suspend time by appearing all at once, Dill's poetic practice makes the time of the making into an object itself to behold. This is the case in Shimmer. Oh, that's okay. This, this is the case, we saw uh, many visions of it. This is the case in Shimmer, to my mind the most breathtaking piece of the show and one that has been wonderfully installed here at the Schnitzer. I would call the piece sublime for its conjuring of the romantic sense of an aesthetic object which presents itself to the viewer as that which all at once exceeds our capacity to comp comprehend it. Barbara Matilski, in the essay included in the catalog published by the Whatcom Museum, 
describes it as a kind of translation of the representations of sublime landscapes that one sees in the Hudson River School. And I believe it not only evokes that tradition of American romanticism, but that the work itself is sublime. This 60-foot experience cascading before the beholder, composed of many thousands of thin wires spilling out across the room like woven strands of hair, which do indeed shimmer in the light as if they shimmered into light. Above that magnificent cascade, tiny foil figures and text play and hover so as to present us with the immensity of scale we associate with the sublime. But they also call attention to their making, flat cutouts that have obviously been affixed there. And of course, on closer inspection, this one great shimmering mass re reveals itself to be strong and woven, a realization that immediately reintroduces the factor of time, and given the scale of the work, makes temporality, the time that it would take to make this thing excel itself sublime. Like so much of her work, which displays its signs of disassembling and reassembling, whether it's the poetry of Emily Dickinson, the visions of Sister Gertrude Morgan, the pieced together allegorical figures that parade in front of Shimmer. So I wanted a, for a title for these remarks that might emphasize this interplay of vision and poesis, what Deb called her going in two directions at once, and what, what Dill calls her, herself calls mist and earth. I like the vital word, the phrase Dill borrows from Dickinson, because it seems to allegorize her own process and to crystallize this relationship between these two poles, vision and poesis. Dill has herself singled out this phrase, and nothing better seems to capture the supreme and vital significance of the word in all its materiality for, for Dill's work. Poetic words and phrases which we read, but also serve as text and textures that are never mere adornments, even when they adorn the garments of performers. So the word is vital, of supreme importance for the making of these pieces. But there is another older and indeed primary meaning of vital, which was itself vital to both Dickinson and her romantic predecessors. For them, vital means immaterial, that force or agency that is not available to the senses, that is indeed itself visionary in that other sense. Dill is supremely aware that for Dickinson, the vital word not only refers to the significance of words for the making of poems and images, or identifies the word that possessed supreme importance, but that words themselves possess their own vitality, their own agency that may indeed issue from elsewhere, perhaps in the place where the visions dwell. Thank you. Thank you all. Anybody have questions, comments? Should I turn a light on? <laughs> Yes? I have one, and I'm uh, very grateful to be here, not only for the show, but this wonderful discussion. And I'm continually amazed at the impact that art and discussion can have in a person's life, hour to hour. And what I have in mind is um, one of her um, uh, bills, pieces of art, one across from the, the shimmer, and it was the um, uh, figure of apparently a woman, the hands raised, holding something, but the, the body was composed of letters, entirely letters. And what seemed to be important, among other things, to deal is what you just mentioned, and others too, about time. And they took it to put on two levels. The most immediate was Leslie Gill wants us to spend some time with her and her works. She's not trying to confuse us, she's trying to converse with us. On the larger scale, that particular image made up of only letters made me think of a person's life that it's composed of everything we read, everything we hear, everything we think about. And every single person's life, I, I would imagine, <laughs> every, thank you, <laughs> every single person's life, I would imagine, is entirely different than anybody else's in terms of what they've read, what they think, 
and everything else, all epitomized through letters. And what struck me the, the most was I want those to come with me to the hereafter. <laughs> I would like my whole life to be with me. I would like to be buried with everything I've heard, everything I've seen, everything I've talked about. And they'll come with me. And if life is a narrative, as has been described many, many times, it may start with a child's first word. Perhaps no. <laughs> but the narrative could lead up to the final word, which should be yes. Deb, I was wondering about two things you said. Um, an artist, you, you described Dill as an artist committed to making the tangible intangible. Did I get that right? Um, I may have, I mean, I think in her case, you can go either way. <laughs> uh, but no, I probably meant, I would, don't know exactly where I was in the talking about it, but I was thinking about how she's always taking something that's real that's right before her, and then she's taking it inside her to a place where there's this well of adequate and inadequate words, and then trying to make something material of it that communicates to us. Yeah, I, I think you did mean to say it. I mean, it fit with what you were saying, but oh, it's that, <laughs> I was wondering about that compared to, um, she doesn't default to the brain and she keeps her mammal sense and it's, she's such a physical listener. But I think mm -hmm. you just answered me, it's that third step, right? So she, may, she takes the real and takes it inside. Mm -hmm. And then it has to come yeah. up with something material, material I see. in order to make that, um, follow that filament mm -hmm. between the two yeah. uh, to bring it yeah. out. Thanks. That's funny because when, when you said that, I wrote it and then I crossed it out <laughs> well, I actually thought it was a really apt description of this. Um, I knew I was going to love this exhibit when Maggie told me it's so big and so gorgeous. You know, that's, she was just so excited about the, the kind of physical presence of it. And, and it is such a physical presence, but it is really abstract, or m maybe abstract's the wrong word, but intangible. Mm -hmm. It's not just readable or, or graspable. Mm -hmm. So I thought it was a great phrase. Thanks for elaborating. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think part of that being overwhelmed is that sense that uh, Trace was talking about, about the time that it takes, yeah. have to, which, you know, we all look at something like that, we, we imagine ourselves making <laughs> well, there's uh, just to respond to that. There's a sense that I mean, particularly in these the classic uh, sort of the examples of the sublime, that it happens all at once, right? Mm -hmm. This sense of mm -hmm. you're sort of swollen and immersed in this thing all at once, and time itself stops. And she plays with that by certainly giving that. I mean, you walk up the stairs, and it's it is. I mean, I was literally breathtaking. And then, on closer inspection, the sense of like, how much time? I mean, how many pieces? And you know, suddenly those two elements sort of shimmer back and forth of something all at once, massive and sublime, and then all of the pieces assembling and disassembling to make it. It's kind of it's, like looking at the frescoes or something, yeah. you know, and thinking Thanks. Uh, with freshmen in class and uh, upstairs, and I'm um, really thrilled at how responsive they are in such an intelligent way. And it's like their antennae are, are just out there uh, drinking it in. I mean, really, uh, th it, that's an experience you don't always get with you know, like giving tours or trying to work with the students and 
Um, uh, so we listen to segments from the opera with the words, and I mean, I'm, I'm re-falling in love with Dickinson, I mean, in, in, with so much depth, every single day, listening to those, that opera presentation and going back and looking again and hearing and all those E words, exaltation, ecstasy, eternity, everlasting, eye, ear. Um, it's, and so these kids are just, they're drinking it in. And um, I really think the, th the four of you helped so much by each presenting your, um, your slant um, and making it uh, clearer yet again. And um, the one other thing I wanted to say that seems important in, in my view of watching, uh, looking at the exhibit is the devotional aspect of that work in time. And she is very, seems to be very aware of that it's a devotion, that it's a, it's a spiritual practice, this work with the collaboration. And then by our, our own communicating with the works and sharing, we become part of that. It's really, uh, it, it's so surprising because we've all felt quite overwhelmed and now it's starting to <laughs> get a little clearer and uh, so just a lot of gratitude. I'd like to speak a little bit to the devotion that you bring up um, just in light of my conversation with her. Um, when I first was talking with her on the phone, she, she said, hold on just a second, uh, I have to go get my straw. And she's like, I, I'm drinking and I have to have my, my, my special straw to drink from because there's so much going on in life and you have to control the things you can control. <laughs> you know, <laughs> okay, well, you know, get your straw. And so she got set up and then um, she said, you know, that she recognizes an obsession and, and her word that I think speaks to that it was obsession. And something that struck me, she said that everything else in her life, including, she specifically mentioned her husband, um, her, her Buddhist practice, everything else that she does is a kind of scaffolding that allows her to keep being obsessed, that allows her to keep doing this work over and over again, and that she sees the rest of her life as a kind of support system for her obsession. And I think that sort of speaks to what you're saying. <laughs> Uh, I'll uh, introduce this uh, with, uh, I know next to nothing about poetry and haven't uh, uh, looked at poetry in any serious way for uh, oh, 40 years now. Uh, but uh, when I went and looked at the exhibit, I, I was struck by two things. One is, uh, in, my, in my view, women were characterized in a pretty Un, uh, unattractive uh, 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 way, you know, the whore of Babylon, mm -hmm. and, and then, uh, you know, this, this list of words that were uh, uh, intoxic, uh, intoxicating, you know, it, it just it's sort of ugly kind of uh, uh, language about, uh, about women. The second thing was because there were so many biblical references uh, you know, and Revelations obviously is, is a biblical uh, reference. Uh, you know, I, I'm looking for, I, I was looking for moralizing, you know, and, uh, you know, I, it wasn't obvious to me that, uh, that it was there, but, you know, that's what the Bible is all about. And, uh, you know, I, are we just looking at this for some sort of experiential uh, uh, moment or is there something that is telling us that we should be changing our behavior in a particular way? Go first. I, I might okay. have an idea. <laughs> um, well, it seems like there's two things that you want to bring up. Uh, one, the sort of sense of negativity toward women and women's bodies that seem to come across to you from the, the use of language like whore and intoxicated. And I think, to me, it seems that Dill is, as I think Deb pointed out really eloquently, um, exploding that and, and reorganizing it in a, in a way that allows for um, intoxication in the, in the ecstatic tradition, 
uh, in a kind of, well, I'm, uh, I'm thinking of Rumi specifically, though that's obviously not at play here literally, but a kind of um, spiritual intoxication that, that by combining that with the image of the whore from, from Revelation seems to me to be claiming that intoxication for a female embodiment and a kind of misbehavior that, that associates it with um, something spiritually productive. And, and disassociates it from the kind of moralizing that, that we might usually look for in, say, the book of Revelation. And then I think in terms of how the Bible comes into play here, um, as Karen was pointing out with uh, the way Dill relates to her texts, um, I don't think she relates to them that literally. She trails through them and sees what sticks. And um, I think that, that when, we, when you go into that room, it's a record of a sort of, of Dill's sort of trailing through this language of, of doom and judgment and, and the end of things to see, what, to see what sticks to her. And what comes out the other side is not a narrative of who wins and who loses, who's bad and who's good, but a kind of um, a collection of the sense of the, the danger of the world, the threat, but that the threat and the, the ecstasy, the threat and the, the divine sort of exist in the same place together in something like Revelation, and that she's She's sort of threading that in without, without literally pulling in that narrative, to, to my mind. I think it's a beautiful mm -hmm. way of characterizing it. And, and you know, the, the sense that, that, that those texts are there, but they're there not as, um, as a program for action, but as pieces to be disassembled and reassembled, and, and also as the sights and sorts of vision. And that's the Sister Gertrude Morgan part of it as well, mm -hmm. that, that she is deeply devout and deeply religious, and yet there is a kind of delirious joy to, to Sister Gertrude Morgan's work that I think the, that then Leslie Dill's piece on that tries to sort of reassemble, so that it is about the work of art and its spiritual possibilities rather than a message that it's trying to convey. And that's how I would see the, the question of, you know, when you say, is it, isn't it all, are there a mess, is there a message here or a moral to be, to be gained? And my sense is no, not in that restricted sense, but in the larger sense of a kind, the kind of possibility of this, you know, what is at stake in the possibility of a sublime experience, some kind of visionary mm -hmm. possibility that, that does, in fact, transcend the sort of ordinariness of, uh, of everyday life and make for new possibilities. That, I think, she's as invested in as Blake was, and that's, again, where I would draw the connection. This is very Blakean, and it's and its religion, its sort of spiritual dimension, but the experiential dimension of the work of art. Uh, is there also an element, A.P., of uh, her emphasizing the words, uh, is there an element of her by emphasizing the words intoxicated or whore of Babylon, is she uh, indicating, so what? <laughs> Maybe. You had your hand up, too. I don't know if it's the elephant in the room or not, but my feeling in listening to Leslie when she spoke, when she walked us through the exhibit, when it went up, is Leslie's brain and mind and heart and soul are different than my brain and how I think and how I see and how I walk through the world. And, you know, we all have different mental healths and mental illnesses and physical health and physical illnesses and ways of being. And I got the impression, and I loved it from Leslie, that she is, is truly different and sees differently and walks through the world differently. So I guess she spoke about her father having schizophrenia, and she spoke about her own vision at age 14, which in other terms could be a psychotic episode. I mean, I'm using harsh words in our community because they have a stigma, but I'm using them because I want them normalized. I, I saw her as a person who has perhaps had these experiences and has transformed her, or not transformed, has used her abilities, her mental abilities and physical abilities to create this art. Does any, I don't know if it's a question about whether or not it's a, a way that she may go through the world? 
for a, a, a non-answer before you get a real answer. I, since you mentioned devotion and you asked about the moral question, uh, a week from tonight, right here, will be another panel of people from various religious studies departments talking about the exhibit, too. And I imagine they're going to talk much more about the the biblical text and the the kind of uh, the didacticism that is or isn't there, and the devotional and spiritual aspects of it. So they might have answers as well. Didn't mean to cut off a mm -hmm. real answer, though. Well, I'm not sure about a real answer, but. My, my first response to that is, I think, probably based in my experience with reading Dickinson, and that so often the tendency is to pathologize her sort of um, different slant, as, as you put it, on the world. And, and so I, I understand the impulse to, to normalize language around psychotic episodes or around, um, around different sorts of mental experiences, but I do think we have to be careful not to make um, make difference into illness um, in, in the way we speak about it. And so for me, um, it's important to recognize that, that art is almost always about restructuring how we see the world and that that can come from, that can come from all kinds of different, um, either inherent, intrinsic different ways of seeing the world or learned, trained, devotional different ways of seeing the world, but that, that it certainly speaks to what art does. But I, I do hesitate to sort of say, like, it comes from, you know, this part of the brain or it comes from, from this certain experience because I, I don't have access to that. I can only sort of see the, see the work. So I, I can't answer it exactly, but that, that would be my sort of first response. Um, I want to thank you all for um, giving me... Um, an incentive to go back. Because when I went up there, I'm, I'm beginning to realize what happened is that I went up there and I think I was basically overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to come back. Mm -hmm. It was um, very, very powerful. And, it, and when I think about, you know, three things. One, a paranoid schizophrenic father and um, an extreme journalist husband and a dramatic mother. I am a psychotherapist. Um, <laughs> um, I think of this child walking through the world and um, listening to her father. I mean, I, I keep thinking that, which can be at times a, 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 a reverse mystical experience, an ecstatic, psychotic, dark, and at times maybe um, <laughs> light filled. I mean it's it's crazy. It's crazy and I love the idea that the words, the puns, the 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 multifaceted meaning of every word um, that gets dark and dark and dark and dark. Um, and I think there's something about the way she puts together this is the world. It is horrifying and it is sublime. Um, I think at times, what I felt up there, up there, <laughs> um, was a feeling of it was too dichotomous. It was either horrifying or ecstatic, and I I had a hard time dealing with it. Um, I also have worked with um, survivors of political torture, so the idea of extreme journalism and what she takes in. You know, not just her paranoid schizophrenic father, but her capacity to to hold darkness is really profound. And um, I'm going to go see it again. I really thank you all for giving it more dimension. One thing I mean, <laughs> as uh, a professor of English literature, we're sort of trained uh, to to avoid at all cost any reference to the maker, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and we do. We spend so much time to our, uh, with our students saying, "Look at the work, uh, not the maker." Uh, we have a thing called the intentional fallacy, and sort of seeking out the sort of the the meanings or evaluations of work in those intentions. And so that's I'm sort of constitutionally resistant, uh, allergic to caring really about what the you know what the I mean I, I care as a human being about the emotional life of the artist, but but maybe not in terms of the work itself. And, but what, I, as I, the, the thing about listening to her, I found it really compelling. And 
what I feel, um, rather than sort of saying she's ill or there's some pathology here, is this extraordinary gratitude to be able to see whatever those eyes see for that period of time. And to me, it seems like a kind of profound gift, not of from illness or pathology, but from some new possibility of seeing. And that's what, it is overwhelming, but I think transformative, potentially. <laughs> so whoever gets the mic first, <laughs> I guess. A technical question. Uh-oh. <laughs> um, do you know whether uh, the, the, the pieces in the, where uh, the piece the Shimmer was in that room, were all meant to be displayed against the wall. I'm, I was just wondering what, what's on the other side of these things. Right. I mean, you know, I mean, I can talk metaphorically what's on the other side, but, <laughs> but um, you know, whereas when you go into the second room, there's that, that third dimension, and right. I, I remember walking into that second room, and I was just sort of totally overwhelmed, mm -hmm. and I realized part of it was just the because of those dimensions to it. You know, I, like I look at Shimmer and. And everyone was talking about how it's sort of coming out. And I, my impressions of it were it was a, it was a curtain. Mm. And there was something mm. behind the mm. curtain. Um, or wonderful? maybe there isn't, you know. Mm. Um, maybe it's the Wizard of Oz, you know. <laughs> <the curtain. laughs> but I'm wondering what that, you know, was it meant to, to be on a wall? Was, what, could some of those things have been floated? And how that would have changed? I think there are some folks from the museum here who could answer that better. Um, when Leslie spoke to us, um, she said that the in different installations in different museums are dependent on the space and so that she doesn't have a set way that something needs to be displayed. And in this case, um, I think she wanted a lot of space in front of Shimmer. And, you know, I think that maybe if the space had been different, she wouldn't have been averse to displaying them so that one could see the both sides. I mean, that I, I'm kind of guessing, but I, it, it seems like she wasn't really attached to... I mean, it, she, wa she cared about how things were displayed. Don't, don't you like, it had to be hung right that shimmer so that the wires would hang correctly but beyond that she was very pleased with with what she saw when she came in I, she, I, I you know I yeah but no I know <laughs> oh well we never saw it so I don't I don't know but my uh, my guess is that had we if we saw it um, she'd be happy that we saw it <laughs> I mean this is all a surmise, but... In the model that she built before she um, sent the piece out, it was shown against a wall. And she spoke uh, on opening night about showing up at a gallery one time when the pieces were in, in a corner and were actually on different walls as being quite startling. But it wasn't that she was unhappy. It just wasn't what she had anticipated. She really wanted the momentum and she wanted the, the length. And I think she also wanted it up against something that we were looking against from what she said. I heard her say this when um, she spoke to us in the preview, or if it's just popped into my head, but the, the whore and the intoxication and the juxtaposition and the, the so-called ugly terminology used with the, um, about the women, it made me think of Whitman, and I can't remember if she mentioned this or not, mm -hmm. with the contrasting the bride and the prostitute and that section in Leaves of Grass. I can't remember if it's I sing the body electric or if it's song of myself, but there was a freedom in that, in, in contrasting the pure with, with, with the desecrated, that is just what it is. And that's what came to me when I saw those images was actually Whitman. Mm. And I don't know if she, did, do you remember her saying anything about Whitman? 
Okay, well, anyway, there, there's that. Well, I do think it gets at a nice sense of, of democracy, though. <laughs> like yeah. in, in Whitman, the way that everything gets into the poem. And something else that, that she said to me um, in our phone interview was that the, she uses fonts as a way of democratizing words, and that by, by um, making one w letter in the middle of a word much larger than you would expect, it sort of um, changes your focus and changes how your brain processes the language and doesn't allow you to sort of put the emphasis where you always would, and instead kind of puts every, all the language on a level playing field, which seems to speak to a similar spirit anyway of, of getting everything in there and letting it sort of be de hierarchical Hierarchialized, <laughs> unhierarchied. <laughs> you get my meaning. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Yes. Thank, Thank you, you, Pamela. Thank you all.